Hello again class, this is Professor Krauss with Lecture 2 where we are going to answer the question, what is the gospel? Let me open with a passage of scripture. There are many passages of scripture that we could turn to for uh, thinking about evangelism, but I think Romans chapter 10 verses uh, 13 through uh, 16 are about as good as it gets. So. Paul says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? How can they believe without hearing about him? How can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, but not all obey the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. Paul lays out a airtight argument for if everybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, should we not all be sent out as Christians to preach the gospel so they can hear and believe and be saved? Let me open us in prayer. Father, thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you for Jesus, for his blood that was shed for our sins. And we thank you as Christians that you have saved us from sin and death and saved us to our mission. And part of our mission involves us sharing the good news of Jesus with others. Pray for these students as they begin this course. I pray for us as Christians that this would be more than information we learn, but something we apply to our lives so that we can be faithful and effective in sharing the good news with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's jump right in. What is the gospel? It is a word you probably read a lot here if you're, you're as we're reading through our textbooks. Is something you hopefully hear over and over and over in church. What exactly is it? Well, the gospel, of course, the word means good news. And the gospel is an announcement. Uh, in the old days, whenever a king or a kingdom would win a battle, they would send out the gospel to all the land. They would send out the good news that they had won a victory, that they had conquered. And so as first century Christians begin to think about their calling and think about their mission as Christians to tell people about Jesus, they use this word gospel, good news, to summarize the message of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. But the gospel is primarily an announcement. It's not a debate. It's not just information that we're telling people. It is an announcement of what has been done in the person of Jesus Christ for sinners. So, in one way of thinking about it, Christians are saved to become announcers. Before we can ever communicate the gospel faithfully and effectively in evangelism, we need to actually know what the gospel is. You know, it's, it's like if I was asking you to do a presentation on a subject. The more you study the subject, talk to people who know about the subject, and, and actually meditate on the ideas, the better you're going to be able to communicate it. If you don't do that, you're going to stumble through it. In the same way, the better, the better we know the gospel, the better that we can share it with people who are lost. Because as we're going to talk about in this class, there's not just one size fits all gospel presentation. So we got to know the gospel so well that as we talk with people and as we listen to people, we can connect the gospel to their lives in a way that is uh, helpful for them. So let's look at some what the, the Bible says about the gospel. Titus 2, 11 through 15 is one of the best passages for looking at the gospel. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. Proclaim these things, encourage and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. So if we just briefly look at Titus 2, 11 through 15, we're going to see first the grace of God has appeared. 
So it's an action of God. It is something God has done to bring salvation. How has He done it? He's done it through grace. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now, what exactly is this grace of God that has appeared? Well, we learn it's Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Savior of the world has appeared. And through Him, uh, there's going to be salvation brought for all people. Uh, you know, um, the, this, this salvation is which we're going to look at throughout this course. What exactly does it mean to be saved? What it means to be rescued? And uh, Titus uses in verse 14 the idea of redemption, to pay a price to save someone out of slavery to something. And so this is what God has done for us in sending His Son Jesus to bring salvation. Now, the gospel, though, this grace instructs us, it teaches us to, to, to turn away from godlessness and worldly lust, and then as we are saved, we are then to live in a way. So it's the idea that the gospel changes us in such a way that we turn away from the old way and we live a different life. All the while, we are waiting for our future hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus gave himself, so there's that sacrifice element of the gospel, uh, and, and then also uh, to cleanse us. The, Jesus gave himself so that we can be cleansed, we can be forgiven of our sins, and here's the goal, so that we can be God's people. So Titus 2, 11 through 15 has a lot of different gospel elements packed into just a short amount of space. Of course, we got 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5. Uh, Paul says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. So Paul, in this opening of his chapter on the resurrection, you know, tries to uh, give a good argument why why people should believe in Jesus. This is not something Paul invented, but something that was passed on to him, that he received, that Christ Jesus died according to the Scriptures. So this is not just something that that was first introduced when Jesus came on the scene. No, this is something that is according to the Scriptures. The Old Testament Scriptures testify to the Christ who would come and die, be buried, and be raised on the third day. Not only that, but you should believe the gospel because Jesus then raised from the dead and, and appeared to Peter, to the twelve, and then to over 500 brothers and sisters afterwards. And then, of course, John three fourteen through 17. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Again, one of the most understood, um, shared um, explanations of the gospel, John three sixteen and 17. God loved the world in this way. How did, he, how did God love the world? He gave His one and only Son, that anybody who believes will not perish eternally, but have life eternally, because God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save it through Him. So these passages uh, give us a good clue about what the gospel message really is. Ephesians 2, 4 uh, through 9. But God, who is rich in mercy, there's that mercy aspect. We are not saved because of our good works, but because God has shown mercy to us. It is through His great love that He had for us. God has made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heaven, heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might display the immeasurable riches of His grace through His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. Um, not only Scripture gives us these clear examples of the gospel, but even something like the Apostles' Creed. The Apostle is a creed. You know, the, the creeds uh, 
are not scripture themselves, but they take scripture and put them in um, shorter um, statements of truth that we can, you know, summarize larger chunks of scripture with these shorter statements of truth. The Apostles' Creed goes like this: I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. This is this is, of course, part of the gospel. This is part of the creed that focuses on Jesus. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, He will come to judge the living and the dead. So, between Scripture and the Apostles' Creed, we get a good look at what the gospel is. Now, turning to the gospel and personal evangelism, what it says, it gives us some very clear statements about what the gospel is and isn't that I think are helpful for us to briefly just consider. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is not that we are simply okay. In Ephesians 2, Paul argues that we are all, all human beings are dead in their sins and trespasses. Meaning, if we are dead, we can't wake up on our own. We need someone to bring us to life. We are not okay. Apart from salvation in Jesus, we will die in our sins. We are condemned because of our sins, and therefore, we'll spend eternity in hell. So, if we believe that overall people are generally okay, yes, sin's kind of a problem, but generally speaking, people are okay, what happens is when we are sharing with people about Jesus, rather than sharing the clear gospel message, we are dead in our sins but Jesus died to make us alive, what happens is we begin to share more of self-help advice. You know, like, yes, yeah, sin's a problem, but what you need to do is you need to correct this and this and everything's going to be okay. It's the exact opposite of what the Bible says. We are not okay. The gospel is not simply that God is love. Yes, God is love. John tells us that in 1 John. But God is love does not mean that He is out of love just going to overlook sin. That at the end of the day, even if we are not Christians, that He is going to accept us into heaven. God is love. God is holy. God is judge. And one day, all sin will be judged. For those of us who are in Christ, we will not be condemned because Christ has already been judged for those sins. But for other people who are are not Christians, who have not put their faith in Jesus, they will remain condemned and guilty in their sin. And if all we do is tell people, well, God is love, God is love, God is love, and they don't know God's word, what they are going to hear is, well, God of love is just going to accept me as I am. And they're never going to turn from their sins. So what is the gospel? The gospel message is not that, hey, God is love. He he loves all people completely and perfectly and 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 you know no matter what you've done God is just going to accept you as you are. That's that's not the tr- that's not the full gospel message. When we communicate nothing but God's love apart from his holiness and his wrath, uh, not only are we talking about a non-biblical God, we're literally making up a God, but we're also communicating to people a very damning message. That in the end, God is just going to overlook their sin. Instead, what we want to do and what the gospel is, is that yes, God is love. And God loves us more than we can ever imagine. And because God loves us more than we can ever imagine, He sent His Son Jesus to die for our sins. And so, what we have to do is we must put our faith in Jesus so that Jesus' uh, blood covers us and our sins are forgiven. uh, Or else we will be judged. The gospel is not that Jesus only wants to be our friend. And I've heard this so much. You know, hallelujah, Jesus is a friend of sinners. That is uh, just mind-blowing news for us as believers. But Jesus is also Lord over all creation. And again, if we only communicate, if all we're saying to people is like, Jesus, Jesus is so loving. He just accepts you just as you are. He just wants to be your friend. What is probably going to happen if if, if, a, some, if someone is not familiar with God's Word at all, we might accidentally lead a person to believe that they don't need to repent of their sins and follow Jesus. That Jesus loves them just as they are even if they never turn from their sins, which is, which is not biblically true. 
uh, the, the Bible is very clear that Jesus loves us. He died for us, but that we must turn from our sins, that our sins uh, prevent us from um, being, our, our sins separate us from God. And so when we think about the idea of Jesus being friends, Jesus is a friend of sinners means, yes, Jesus loves sinners. He died for sinners, but we must turn from our sins and turn to Jesus. We've got to be clear what we communicate in the gospel. And finally, the gospel is not that we only need to live rightly. And this is tough. Because we want people to turn from their sins. We want people to realize you can't just you can't just become a Christian and then keep on just living however you want to. But we must be careful to com- to not to communicate to believers that God saves us based on our good works. We need to communicate to people that God loves us right where we are, and if we turn from our sins, He will save us then we're going to start living rightly. But God does not love us more based on how we live. God loves us based on what Jesus has done for us. And so we need to communicate to the, the gospel message is not, hey, if you do good works, you will be saved. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says we are not saved by our works. It is God's grace that we're saved. So if we add any hint of you need to live this way in order to be saved, we lose the entire gospel. Because the gospel's message is we are saved by grace. We are saved by what God has done for us in Jesus, not by anything we do. So we, if we want to communicate the idea of living rightly, what we want to say to people is you are saved only by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. It's nothing that you've done but when you are saved, then because Jesus is Lord and He has saved you, then we want to go out and live rightly because of what God has done for us, not to try to earn His love. So, the better we know the gospel, the better we know Titus in John 3.16 and in Romans and those passages and even the Apostles' Creed, the better we can, as Christians, live in the gospel, which we need to do, but also the better we can share the gospel with the lost. Thankfully, God's Word makes it very clear what the gospel, what the good news of Jesus is, so that we can know the gospel, we can treasure the gospel, and we can share it faithfully and effectively with others. Thank you for tuning in to this lecture. Uh, If there's anything I can do to further clarify and explain this lecture, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out by email or leave a comment uh, there on uh, YouTube. And I look forward to seeing you in our next lecture. God bless.